We have been studying and we are studying the armor of God from Ephesians chapter 6. We have explained that you and I are engaged in a spiritual battle. And our premise is very simple. Until we address the invisible spiritual cause of a matter, we can never fully address its visible physical manifestation. Most of the things that happen into our lives come from a visible physical reality. But Paul wants us to know that it emanates from an invisible spiritual source. It is your ability and my ability to address the invisible spiritual cause that leads to the visible physical cure. The unfortunate problem today is that most of us address physical visible problems in physical visible ways. Which means on our best day we're dealing with fruit not root. We're dealing with a cure without addressing its cause. Paul wants you to know flesh and blood, the physical realm, is not the source of your problem. It is merely the vehicle through which the source works to bring you your problem. So if you spend all of your time addressing the physical visible manifestation, flesh and blood, and very little of your time dealing with the invisible spiritual cause or source or root, then the best thing you can do with that issue is manage it, not fix it. Because you're not dealing with where it came from. The scripture says that we died with him, we were buried with him, we were raised with him, and now we are seated with him in heavenly places. He says that in the book of Ephesians. We are now living spiritually in another realm. So that unless you operate in this realm, from that realm you will be controlled by this realm. So much of our defeat, frustration, misery, anguish, agony, and difficulty comes from the fact that we are forgetting our primary location. Because we have forgotten the fact that the spiritual realm and your ability to function in it determines how you make out in the realm of the five senses. The problem occurs because the realm of the five senses we're used to. The realm of the five senses, that's the way we flow. The five senses, that's the environment that we know about, hearing and seeing and tasting and touching and smelling. We, we know that world. This other world mm, seems so out there, so otherworldly, so spacey, so twilight zone-ish. It seems so untouchable. So because it doesn't seem as real as the five senses, it's not given the priority of the five senses, which means we're controlled by the five senses. What Paul wants you to understand is that what Jesus Christ achieved, we ought to stand firm in. That's why he says over and over again, stand firm, stand firm, stand firm, beginning in verse 10, because he wants you and I to understand that we don't have to leave what Christ did to deal with what we face. The moment you leave it, you lose your positioning. So we started off with his first piece of armor, we call it dressing for success. He calls it in verse 13, he calls it the uh, belt of truth. If you're going to operate from the spiritual realm, uh, verse 14, you must first of all put on your truth belt. We explain truth is God-based knowledge. Truth is more than facts. You can have facts and not have the truth. If you only operate on the facts, you may never graduate to the truth and only the truth sets you free. But the truth that sets you free must be the truth you know. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So if you don't know the truth, you won't be free. And if you settle for facts without graduating to the truth, then you're settling for information that's not transforming. So a lot of us operate on facts and information, never getting to the truth, which is the God-based reality behind the information. And if you never get to that, you never get to God. If you never get to God, you never get to truth. If you never get the truth, you never get to the origin of a thing. If you never get to the origin of a thing, you never get to the cause and cure for the thing you're dealing with that the facts have indicated to you. Facts are not enough. Facts are essential. You got to start with facts to get to the truth, but facts are never enough. Facts are just the starting point to deliver the truth. 
Facts are, the truth is, objective, absolute reality. It's objective, it operates outside of you, it's absolute, it's non-negotiable, and it's reality in its original form. Therefore, the only original person is God, so the only way you can arrive at truth is to start from what God says about a subject. That's why we told our young people, when you start with truth, David said, you can know more than your teachers. Because they're occupied with facts. Never arriving at the truth. He then says, you put on the breastplate of righteousness in verse 14. He says, the breastplate of righteousness. When you learn the truth, you know the right way to go. So then you move in the right way because of the truth you've now discovered. Once the truth governs the decision, then you are now protected. Why? Because the devil operates in a lie and he operates wrongly. So if you're operating in the truth and moving rightly, he has no influence over you. So you need truth, God-based knowledge, that leads to right decision-making, right choices, where Satan cannot enter or operate from, which blocks him. The moment he can function on a lie, or function on facts without truth, or get you to move wrongly rather than rightly, gotcha. In the spiritual realm, which manifests itself in the visible physical realm. He now comes to verse 15, our verse for the day, and he wants to talk about your shoes. He wants to talk about your shoes. He's moved from your belt to your breastplate, which is the heart of righteousness, heart to please the Lord, heart to move in the way the truth has directed you. And now he wants to talk about your shoes. This is a day of shoes. There are shoes for everything. There are dress shoes. There are casual shoes. There are a million kind of athletic shoes. There are shoes that you put on your feet appropriate to every occasion. I am sure most of the ladies in here have a wardrobe full of shoes. Shoes all over the place, designed to adorn your feet. Guess what Paul wants you to know? Paul says in verse 14, there are shoes that if you wear them and don't take them off, will address a major issue of spiritual warfare in your life. He says in verse 15, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shod means what you have on. He says on your feet ought to be some footwear. And this footwear is preparation for the gospel of peace. The Greek word for preparation means readiness. You will be ready for the devil if you got your shoes on. You will be ready for his attacks if you're wearing your shoes. He says, if your feet are shod, you will be in readiness. You will be prepared to deal with the enemy. But you got to have your shoes on. Now, to understand why he is saying this, you have to understand that the Roman soldier had what most football, what all football players have, they had cliques. They had spikes that emanated out of their shoes and the purpose of the spike in the Roman soldier's shoe was to give him sure footing. It was to keep him from going James Brown, slipping and sliding. It was to keep him mobile. It was to keep him stationary in battle and in conflict so he was not easily knocked over. So he was not evilly dismantled because the cleat, the spikes that came out of the bottom of the shoe gave him sure footing when he was under attack. Because we're talking about spiritual warfare. So when the Roman soldier was under attack, the, the spike, the cleat, would give him footing so that the enemy would not knock him down, knock him over, would not remove him from his place of stability. When he says have your feet shod, he is talking about positioning yourself in a stationary position so when the devil comes, which he calls the evil day in this passage, he can't knock you over. He can't knock you off of your feet. He can't knock you out and knock you down because what you have on you is stationary. It has sunk itself in deep, giving you a stationary position or sure-footedness 
in order to keep him from knocking you over. I know what it is, you know what it is at various levels to be knocked over by the evil one. You've been knocked over. Your circumstances have knocked you over. Your situation has knocked you over. Other people have knocked you over. Your finances have knocked you over. Your job situation has knocked you over. It has removed you from your place of stability. Your sure-footedness has slipped. You have slipped and slid because you were not able to hold on to the turf. He has told us over and over again, stand firm, stand firm, stand firm. He now tells us at 15, you can't stand firm without shoes on. You need shoes on, you need shoes with cleats to hold you steady when you're under attack. So what he wants to do is create, here it is, stability. He wants to create sure-footedness. He doesn't want you sliding. He wants you steady. He wants you holding on to the ground. He wants you solidified in the turf. He wants you holding on under attack because this is a war frame, under attack. I wish I could tell you now that you know Jesus, you won't be attacked. But that's a lie. We know it's a lie. Ain't nothing but a lie from hell. Because sometimes you haven't seen hard till you met Jesus. Because once you meet Jesus, you are now under attack. Now, now let me tell you the essence of the attack. And we'll deal with this, this shoe that you're supposed to be wearing. The essence of the attack of the spiritual realm, Satan and demons... The essence of the attack is to keep God's purposes, will, provision, blessings from being manifested in your life. The purpose of his war, now that you're saved, he can't take away your salvation, but he can sure make you a miserable Christian. So since he can't take away your salvation, what he does want is to keep your salvation from working for you. Now he can't keep you out of heaven, but he can make you have hell on earth by keeping what has happened to you when you accepted Christ from being manifested in your reality. So that's his goal in spiritual warfare, to keep you in defeat and to keep you playing defense. He doesn't want you in an offense position, but we're going to change the side of the ball we're on. He says, I want you to put on the shoes and what is this pair of shoes you and I are supposed to be wearing? We started with truth. God-based knowledge, objective, absolute reality in its original form, God-based form. We go to right decision-making, rightness, in light of the truth that I learned. He now says, put on some shoes, and these shoes are the gospel of peace. He says, the shoes I want you to wear under attack is the gospel of peace. Let's talk about peace. All of us know the opposite of peace, anxiety, worry. That's the opposite of peace. So if you don't know what peace is, if you know what worry is, not doing that. That's peace, okay? The biblical definition of peace is calm and tranquility of soul. Peace is calm and tranquility of soul in the midst of of difficult circumstances. Let me give you that definition again. The biblical definition of arene, the Greek word for peace, is calm and tranquility of soul despite external turmoil. Two painters one day were asked to paint a picture of peace in a contest and they wanted to see they were going to win a thousand dollars for whoever painted the best picture of peace. The first painter painted his picture, and oh, what a serene portrait it was. It was a picture of a lake. The sun was glistening off of the lake so you could see the, the shine across the water. The water was still. The painting included a shepherd walking sheep by this serene lake. Trees were on the side of the lake with birds in them. And it was a picture of calm and tranquility and ease and peace. What a great picture. The second gentleman came out with his portrait and it wasn't like the first one. The sky was pitch black. Lightning was shooting through. 
The thunder was roaring. The waves on the water were billowing up and down. Boats that were on the water were being tossed about. Trees were blowing in the wind horrifically. It was a portrait of disaster. But in the corner, all the way at the bottom, on the left hand side of the portrait, right there at the edge of this horrific circumstance in life was a little bird standing on a rock with its mouth open, songs coming out of its mouth, and one little light coming from the darkness of the cloud shining down on the bird as it sung in the midst of its darkness. When they made the decision about the portrait, they said the second man won with the dark surroundings because that's biblical peace. Biblical peace is when nothing's wrong, I'm calm. When nothing's wrong, you're supposed to be calm. Something wrong with you if nothing's wrong and you're worried. If nothing's wrong and you're anxious, you have issues. Biblical peace is when everything is wrong. There is thunder and lightning and the winds blowing and circumstances are against you and nothing looks right and you're still singing. It's when nothing should be creating a song and you still have a song. It's when there is tranquility on the inside despite chaos on the outside. It's when things are at ease when trouble is all around. You don't know whether you have biblical peace until things are not peaceful. The only way you got biblical peace as opposed to peace that anybody would have when everything's okay is because all hell is broke loose and you're still singing. Guess what the Bible calls that? It calls it a peace that passes understanding. In Philippians chapter 4, he says the peace that God gives is a peace you don't understand. And the reason you don't understand it is because based on the situation, you shouldn't be peaceful right now. So why am I singing when there is no song? Why am I calm when everything's chaotic? Why can I be stable when everything around me is trouble? Because God has given me a peace that passes understanding. Because I don't even understand why I'm singing right now. So nobody else understands why I'm calm right now. Nobody else understands why when I lost my job, I didn't lose my mind. Nobody else understands why when there's no money in the bank, I'm still praising the Lord for his provision. Nobody else understands why the doctor gave me a bad prognosis and I'm still laying here blessing the Lord on my soul and all that is within me, I'm blessing his holy name. Nobody else understands why when my world is falling apart I'm not falling apart with it because you got a peace that passes understanding that's peace in the Bible in fact so important is this peace this calm that Colossians 3 verse 15 says let the peace of God rule in your heart let the peace of God rule in your heart. The Greek word for rule means umpire. What does an umpire do in a baseball game? Ball strikes. He calls it. That's what an umpire does. He calls it. If it's a ball, calls the ball. If it's a strike, calls it a strike. And guess what? Whatever he calls it, that's the way it is. He makes the call. Let the peace of God make the call in your life. Now, why do you need to know that? Because life is full of decisions and choices. Life is full of, you know, do I go this way? Do I go this way? Do I go that way? He says, once you've aligned with truth, you found God's view on a matter. Once you've now begun to do righteousness based on the truth, let the peace of God make the call. In other words, God will show you what to do once you're operating on the truth you know by giving you a calm about the decision. He will calm your heart by the Holy Spirit, giving you peace. Sometimes you'll look at a situation and all the facts may line up, but you'll say, but I just don't feel right about it. Something not right about this. Something that God hasn't released me. I do not have peace or calm about this thing. You always hold up where there is no peace. Because what he says is, I want your feet 
And remember, the Greek word is to have, is the, the verb is to have, meaning don't ever take these shoes off. You are to flow in peace once you've picked up truth and righteousness. Peace is to be your flow. Okay, now, now let me explain something here. If peace is not your normal way of operating, you're out of sync spiritually. Let me say it another way. If worry is your normal way of operating, if worry is your modus operandi, if anxiety is how you roll, you just go from one worry to another, one anxiousness to another, and that's how you roll, you're not wearing your shoes. You're going out with no shoes on. You're supposed to roll with peace, not roll with worry. So the mere fact that worry, now everybody has moments of worry because we still live in our flesh. But I'm talking about what's normative for you. Is peace normative or is worry and anxiety normative? If worry and anxiety is normative, then that means you are not wearing your shoes. But don't worry because I'm going to tell you how to put your shoes on and how to tie them up. Okay, But I just want to get this straight. Peace is to be the normal ruling operative program in your life. John 14 verse 27, John 14 verse 27, Jesus is getting ready to go into a very non-peaceful situation and get ready to be crucified. Guess what Jesus says on his way to be crucified? He turns to his disciples in John 14 27 and he says, peace I leave with you. He says, and then he goes deeper, he says, my peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives you peace. See, the world can give you peace momentarily okay the world can give you peace in the form of a pill they give you pill popping peace okay they, they, the world will give you pill popping peace the world will give you peace in form of an ejection okay the world will give you peace in, in form of Prozac. The world will give you peace in form of entertainment. If I get entertained, then for two hours, three hours, I want to think about how miserable I am. Cause it'll be, so the world will give you peace. But here is the difference between the peace God gives and the peace the world gives. The peace the world gives is outside in. It's something they do outside that you put in here that makes you feel better temporarily. Jesus says, that is not the peace I'm talking about. Peace I leave with you, and the peace that I leave with you will be my peace. And what kind of peace do you have? Peace that can even handle a cross, because he's on his way to be crucified. Peace that can handle you getting ready to be slain, that's the peace, because I'm getting ready to go to the cross and I'm chilling. They get ready to put a crown of thorns in my head, and I'm, I'm cool. You know, I don't prefer it, I don't like it, let this cup pass from me, but we're going to roll with it. He says, that's the kind of peace I want you to have. And that's the kind of peace I want to be normal for you. Not showing up every now and then. Worry should show up every now and then. Anxiety should show up every now and then. Peace you're supposed to roll with as long as you leave your shoes on. Okay? So he says, put on or have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Jesus said in another place, he says in John 16, 33, he says, um, Peace I leave with you. In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now in order to overcome something, you got to have something to overcome. That's why peace is always tied to you overcoming something. So many things go wrong in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year. Some of it you have control of it. Some of it you have absolutely no control of. And it will send you spinning. So hear me out now. How do you put the shoes on, tie, lace them up, and don't take them off? He tells you. Have your feet shod with the preparation, here it is, of the gospel of peace. Peace that Jesus is giving away, he says, is in the gospel. Okay, follow me now. Peace that Jesus is giving away is in the gospel. Let me say that again. Peace that Jesus is getting away is not in a pill, not in a shot, not in your homies, not in your favorite television program, not in the movies, not in a vacation, not in more money, not in a better job. That's the world's peace. He says the peace that I am talking about that you wear on your feet. 
that hold you stable, regardless of external situations, is in the gospel. He calls it the gospel of peace. So to understand the peace that Jesus is talking about, you got to understand the gospel. So let's go back to the gospel. The Greek word for gospel is the word huangelion. That's how it's pronounced. Huangelion is simply translated good news. So I got some good news for you. The good news of peace. Now watch this. You stick with me now because we're getting ready to go deep sea diving. Okay? The good news of peace. The huangelion, the gospel, this word is used a whole lot in the New Testament. But it was rarely ever used outside of the New Testament, either in classical Greek or Koine Greek. Koine Greek means the Greek of the common people. So classical Greek was the more sophisticated Greek. Koine Greek was Greek of the everyday folk. Okay? The word gospel is rarely found in classical or Koine Greek, but it's all over the New Testament. Why didn't they use it much? Because the word gospel in the normal Greek dialect and dialogue and Greek speaking to people would only be used when the good news was so good it was too good to be true. So they didn't use this word. I mean, it's like going around talking about supercalifragilistic espialidocious. I mean, that's just not something you do, you know? That's not a normal used word. Well, they wouldn't use euangelion too often because the news had to be so good, it had to be too good to be true. Yet in the Gospels and in the Epistles, it's gospel, 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 gospel. Why? Because the good news is too good to be true. So the question is, What's the good news then? That's so good that it's too good to be true. Well, we all know that the gospel refers to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as our substitute for our sins. We know that. And we know that when a person trusts Christ alone for the forgiveness of sins and for the gift of eternal life, they are forgiven for time and eternity for sin. We know that, okay? And that means we are saved or born again. Because you say, I'm saved, but I don't live with peace. I live with worry. Well, here's the problem. You either don't believe or understand the gospel. Or I don't believe or understand the gospel. And here's the problem. Most Christians apply the gospel only to what it takes to get to heaven. See, we only apply the gospel to getting saved so that I don't go to hell and I go, I go to live with Jesus Christ forever. That's just the part of the gospel. The gospel has a whole bunch to do with earth. I, I love Romans 5, verses 5 to 10. Read it when you get a chance. He says, you know, when we were sinners, Christ died for us. But then he says, if we were saved by his death, How much more shall we be saved by his life? In other words, we saved for heaven by his death. But he says when he rose from the dead and went up to heaven and seated on the right hand of the father, he's delivering you for life. We know the gospel because of the death. What we have missed is the gospel of the life. All right, now I do want you to turn here. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Okay, here is where we're going to go deep sea diving here. Now, may the God of peace, did you hear that? Now, may the God of peace himself, oh, I love that word himself. It means God with nobody else's help. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read that again. May the God of peace all by himself, himself, sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. When you accepted Jesus, you were justified. That means God declared you righteous and now you got a free passport to heaven. But the rest of your time on earth is being sanctified. 
That is being transformed in your soul. He says, the God who gives peace does it as part of his sanctification process. And the God who gives peace, who does it as part of this part of the gospel, the sanctifying part of the gospel, does it, here it is, from spirit to soul to body. And the order is everything. He does not do it from body to soul to spirit. He does it from spirit to soul to body. So if you're looking out here for peace, you're looking in the wrong direction. He does not start with the body, then go to the soul, then wind up with the spirit. He starts at the spirit, he says, the God of peace, and he moves to the soul, then he moves to the body. The reason why we can't find peace is we're doing it back words Christian soldiers we're trying to find peace in the wrong direction all right let me explain your spirit that's the God part of you that's the perfect part of you if any man is in Christ he's a new creation all things pass away and behold all things become new the second Corinthians 5 17 he says the spirit is the thing of God the nature of God that's been deposited in every believer and it is perfect all of God is operative right now in your spirit. Everything of God's power is in your spirit, God's presence is in your spirit, joy is in your spirit, peace is in your spirit, power is in your spirit, righteousness is in your spirit, holiness is in your spirit. Everything that's perfect is in your spirit. That is the one part of you the devil does not have access to. Because if the devil had access to it, it wouldn't be perfect. It is the perfect divine nature of God and it is the only place the spiritual realm of darkness does not have access to. If you've accepted Christ, you've got a pill inside of you, a spirit pill, a seed the Bible calls it, that is full of the DNA of deity. All right? The problem is your perfect spirit is lodged in your imperfect soul. Your soul is your personality. It's your mind, your emotions, and your will. That's your personality, and that is distorted and damaged. So if your body is malfunctioning, it's because it's got a malfunctioning soul. The mind is malfunctioning, the emotions are malfunctioning, and the choices are malfunctioning. A malfunctioning soul, which all of us have, leads to a malfunctioning body. Well, now, if I got a malfunctioning body and I got a malfunctioning soul, how is my malfunctioning body going to go out and fix my malfunctioning body when my body is malfunctioning? I can't fix me. I can only try to manage my mess. That's why New Year's resolutions don't last. Because that's managing your mess. That is trying to get the outside of you to fix the inside of you. God doesn't work that way. He works, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, from spirit to soul to body. That's how he works. So here it is. So if I want my body to work right, I got to get my soul working right. Because my body only does what my soul tells it to do. But the problem is my soul doesn't work right. My soul has been affected by the way I was raised. My soul has been affected by the sins I've committed. My soul has been affected by people who committed sins against me. My soul has been affected by scenarios. My soul has been affected by what my peers think. My soul has been affected by television and radio and, and movies. And My soul has been affected by things I've learned in school. And my soul has got all this information coming to it. And that's why my soul is one way one year and another way another year. That's why my personality is all up and down. And, and my, I got a problem in my soul and my soul is telling my body what to do. So when my soul is worried, my body starts twitching. So when I get nervous and, and I stay nervous long enough, my eyes start twitching because, because my soul is damaged and it's telling my body what to do. It's called psychosomatic illnesses. That's what psychology calls it. Psychology, the study of the soul, is tells you you can have psychosomatic illnesses. You go to the doctor and you say, this is her net certain. They say, I can't find anything wrong. Well, what has happened is that the damaged soul is rubbing off on the body. And so the body is expressing the damage. And that's what happens when we lose our peace. The peace is not lost in the body. The peace is lost in the soul so the body can't sleep. The peace is lost in the soul, so the body wants to stay laying down. The peace is lost in the soul, so the body gets mad and you get a temper and you cuss and fuss and stay mad because you got an angry soul. It just comes out in your vocabulary. 
It's the angry soul, the unpeaceful soul that's telling the body that you got to let everybody else know how miserable you are. So when you say somebody don't, don't, you ought to stop cussing, you ought not cuss like a sailor when their soul has not been fixed. All they can do is manage language. They can't be changed by it. So, but most people start at the body and hope they can do something with the soul so they go for analyzing and counseling. So I'm going to save you $300 an hour right now. Okay, because this is free. May the God of peace, the, the God who gives him peace all by himself, himself, sanctify you. The Greek word sanctify means to set apart as unique or special. So I'm talking about something special now. May the God of peace sanctify you in your spirit, soul, and body. So here's how it works. The goal of the spirit is to release into the soul the DNA of God. The goal of the spirit is to release into the soul the DNA of God. So that the soul gets changed because of what's being released into it by the spirit. Then the goal of the soul is to release the DNA that came from the spirit into the body. So the body piggybacks off the soul because the soul is piggybacking off of the spirit. The reason why we don't have peace is that the soul is not piggybacking off the spirit. So the soul doesn't have that information to pass on. So the question is, how do I get the soul to piggyback off of the spirit so that I can have peace? Because I need to go to sleep. I need to be able to rest. I need to stop worrying. I need to stop twitching. I need to stop being so anxious. But my soul has got to get back to my spirit, not talk to my body. Okay, here it is. In order for the soul to grab the spirit, here it is, the soul must agree with the spirit. Okay, follow me now. If the soul disagrees with the spirit, the spirit won't release anything. Because the spirit is perfect and it won't partner with imperfection. The spirit will only partner with the soul when the soul agrees with the spirit, which is why you must start with truth. You must start with truth because that's the way things really are. Despite how you feel, despite what mama taught you, despite what you learned in school, despite what you know all your life, despite what your posse thinks, if it doesn't agree with the spirit, it must be rejected. Once the soul accepts the outside, the inside will close up, clam up, and release nothing. So you could be searching for peace for the rest of your life and all you will get is management on the outside and no change on the inside because nothing is being released from the spirit into the soul. Because the gospel only relates to what Jesus Christ accomplished, not what the doctor can prescribe. It only relates to what Jesus Christ has accomplished. May the God of peace Send peace from the spirit into the soul so that it winds up in the body. So here's the only way to get peace. I'm talking about real peace, not fake peace. The only way is when the soul has to make a decision. When you have to decide which way to go, which road to take, how am I going to not worry in this situation? I just lost my job. There's no money in the bank. I got the facts. The facts don't look good. The facts are causing me to worry. I must then retreat to what the spirit says. The spirit says, I don't have any money in my pocket, but the spirit says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now that's what the spirit says in truth. My soul says, you broke as a skunk. My soul says, how you gonna pay your light bill? My soul says, they gonna kick you out of your house. My soul says, and that's fact. The fact is I'm broke. The fact is my soul is telling me the truth. They're going to cut my lights out. It's not that my soul is wrong. It's that my soul doesn't have the truth. It just has the facts. But once my soul goes to my spirit and the spirit says the truth of God's word and the soul and the spirit agree, a release valve is opened up. And out of the spirit flowing into the soul is the peace of God that passes understanding because life Last year this time, I would have lost my natural mind. 
but the spirit has been able to release into the soul so now my body can go to sleep at night knowing I'm going to sleep on the truth and I can tell my soul you're lying you ain't nothing but a liar and I'm calling myself a liar you are a liar because God is the truth so the God of peace will flow peace listen the moment you begin to worry you ought to tell yourself the moment that worry pops up you can't stop it from popping up but the moment it pops up and seeks control that's the moment you want to run to the spirit and the only way to run there is to find out God's view on the subject that's the only way to run to the spirit you know that's why I love Philippians 4 7 it says be anxious for nothing but in all things through prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And it says, and watch this now, I love this. And when you go to God during those worrisome moments, watch this, it says, Philippians 4, 7 says, go with thanksgiving. Why does he tell you to go with thanksgiving? Okay, watch this, you don't want to miss this, this is sweet. Because... When God deposited the spiritual seed in you, it's like an acorn. All the oak is already located. In other words, you don't have to infuse anything into an acorn to help it become an oak. Once it's planted in the right location, it will become an oak because all the oak is already in the acorn. All the God is already in the spirit. You don't have to add God to God to get God. All the God you're ever going to get is already there. So when you go to God and say, I have a need, I have a situation, I have a circumstance, what I'm giving thanks for is that the answer has already been deposited in the spiritual realm. Lord, I got this problem, but you talked about this answer. That answer has already been deposited, so I want to thank you, even though I don't see it manifested yet, that it's going to be manifested because the Spirit already houses it. It's already there. See, that's why I can give thanks, and you can give thanks even in tough times because God has already answered in advance in the Spirit. Your goal isn't to try to get something new. Your goal is to draw out what God has already deposited. It's a change of direction. Look, submarines don't have to get nervous in a storm because they're going deep. Fish, fish don't have nerve attacks when it's storming because they know storms or as bad as storms get they will only get 25 feet below sea level on the worst day so they go 26 feet in other words they go deep when things get chaotic when your world gets chaotic that's the time to go deep that's the time to dip down. That's the time to say, okay, God, you sending me to the spirit realm where there's calm down there. There's peace down there. There's cool down there. I can chill down there because down there is the perfect mind of God in the spirit. But we retreat out there to that which can't give us real peace, only world peace. So my challenge is you just put on your shoes and don't take them off. Don't take them off. This is something you keep on you at all times in all situations. Don't take them off. Isaiah 26, 3 says, And you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you. When your mind agrees with God's mind, you will get God's spiritual results. And then you'll know you've just experienced God. Oh, I love the story of the three Hebrew boys. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They got fired, and I do mean fire. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar said, we're firing you. When they heard the bad news, now you're talking about something that will take away your peace. You're getting ready to be burned alive. That'll take away your peace. They looked at Nebuchadnezzar and said, oh, Nebi, we do not have to be concerned about answering you according to this matter. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us 
from your furnace of burning fire. And then he went on to say, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow before your gods. Nebuchadnezzar got so ticked off that he told them to light the furnace and make it seven times hotter than it normally is. Because he was upset that they didn't quiver at the threat. They were thrown in. See, following God doesn't mean you don't hit the fire. They were thrown in. After a while, Nebuchadnezzar came up and looked inside and said, what is this? We put in three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We tied them up. I'm looking through this glass and I see four men. And they're all walking around in the fire. Full of peace, full of calm, in a bad situation. That's because there was a fourth person in the fire. God joined them in it. Let me explain something to you. God's not going to join the world to help you out. He's not going to, you going out there and you calling on God and praying to God so God can come out here to the world to give you the peace. Because God would be compromising his peace to join their peace. But if you will take your stand with the mind of God, the God of peace all by himself will show up in the fires of life and take off the ropes, take off the chains and give you peace. They were under fire. There's somebody in here today and you're under fire. You've lost your job. Listen, don't panic. Run to the spirit realm. David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken and I've never seen that seed begging bread. And you hold on to what God said and watch what God does. Some of you were fired from your job and you don't know where your new job is. Well, you run back to the spirit realm and say, God, you said that if a man doesn't work, he ought not eat. I'm willing to work so I can eat. So I thank you for the job you're already preparing that hasn't become manifest yet. You go back to the spirit realm. Every time Satan wants to remove your peace, you look down at your feet. You hold your ground. You connect with the spirit world so that you let this world know that that world is telling you what to do. And he will give you a peace that passes 